Greetings and welcome to the Marriott Vacations Worldwide Second Quarter 2024 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Neil Goldner, Vice President, Investor Relations. Thank you, Neil. You may begin. Thank you, Paul, and welcome to the Marriott Vacations Worldwide Second Quarter Earnings Conference Call. I am joined today by John Geller, our President and Chief Executive Officer, and Jason Marino, our Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I need to remind everyone that many of our comments today are not historical facts and are considered forward-looking statements under federal securities laws. These statements are subject to numerous risks and uncertainties which could cause future results to differ materially from those expressed in or implied by our comments. Forward-looking statements in a press release as well as comments on this call are effective only when made and will not be updated as actual events unfold. Throughout the call, we will make references to non-GAAP financial information. You can find a reconciliation of non-GAAP financial measures and the schedules attached to our press release and on our website. With that, it's now my pleasure to turn the call over to John Geller. Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our second quarter earnings call. We had a mixed second quarter with rentals exceeding our expectations and lower VPGs negatively impacting our contract sales. In addition, we have not seen the necessary improvement in our loan delinquencies, so we increased our sales reserve to reflect higher expected defaults, which Jason will provide more color on later in the call. So let's start with contract sales. As we look back at the cadence of the quarter, April VPG was soft, but May was in line with the prior year, which gave us confidence for the rest of the quarter. However, June VPG declined on a year-over-year basis, and contract sales declined 1% for the quarter as we were successful growing tours offset by a decline in VPG. VPGs for owners were flat in the second quarter compared to last year, reflecting the value owners put on their vacations. We were able to grow first-time buyer tours by 9%, reflecting our strategy to grow new owners, but did see a 12% decline in first-time buyer VPGs. We were able to grow contract sales 3% in the quarter, excluding Maui. This illustrates the quality and location of our upper upscale vacation ownership product, the high premium people put on their vacations, our tour growth, and the fact that our owners continue to see long-term value of investing in their future vacations. Given the higher cost environment consumers have been dealing with over the last few years and the uncertain broader macro picture, we have adjusted certain sales promotions recently to combat the softening in VPGs. Meanwhile, our resort occupancies in the quarter were up more than a point year over year, driven by a four-point improvement in rental occupancies as consumers continue to prioritize spending on experiences. Our rental results also had a very strong quarter, driving higher revenue from more keys rented and lower costs primarily from higher preview packages to drive contract sales. As a result, rental profit in our VO segment increased more than 60% compared to last year, with margin improving to more than 20%. In our exchange and third-party management business, Interval International ended the quarter with more than 1.5 million active members, while inventory utilization was in the low 90% range, consistent with last year. As we look forward, We adjusted full-year contract sales guidance to reflect our expectations for lower VPGs for the second half of the year. While July VPGs improved from the softness we saw in June, the midpoint of our guidance for the second half of the year reflects VPGs to be down around 7% compared to to down 6% in the first half in tours to grow around 12% as we lap Maui, implying a 5% contract sales growth in the second half. Maui continues to recover, though we now expect contract sales to be down roughly $10 million for the full year as the recovery is turning out to be slower than our original expectations. This should still provide us a two-point tailwind in contract sales growth in the second half of the year as our sales centers were closed from mid-August until the end of September last year. 
We also expect to generate higher first-time buyer tours, which carry a lower VPG. We ended the quarter with nearly 270,000 packages, with roughly 30% of those customers having already confirmed to take their vacation in the second half of the year. While we're disappointed with the additional sales reserve we took, we continue to manage the business through the broader macro uncertainty. On one side, consumers appear cautious after two years of inflation, while on the other side, they are still spending on travel and experiences. We're seeing that play out in our resorts, where we ran over 90% occupancy in the second quarter. If we exclude the impacts of the additional sales reserve, the improvement in our rental performance and our other cost management initiatives would have offset most of the impact from the lower contract sales guidance compared to our original full year adjusted EBITDA guidance. We have also been working through our 2025 maintenance fee budgets and expect the average maintenance fee will increase less than 5% for our points products after two years of significantly higher increases. We believe this will help restore confidence from both, <coughs> for both uh, recent first-time buyers as well as long-term owners. With that, I'll turn it over to Jason to discuss our results in more detail. Thanks, John. Today I'm going to review our second quarter results, our balance sheet and liquidity position, and our outlook for the rest of the year. Starting with our vacation ownership segment, Contract sales declined 1% in the quarter on a year-over-year -year basis, with a 5% increase in tours being offset by lower VPG, and sales grew 3% year-over-year, excluding Maui. As I mentioned during our last call, we needed the improvements and delinquencies that we saw in March and April to continue, which did not happen. While delinquencies were flat to the first quarter, they were 120 basis points above 2023 levels, driving the need to increase the reserve on the balance sheet by $70 million. Under timeshare accounting rules, we booked a $13 million offset in cost of vacation ownership products, so the net impact to adjusted EBITDA was $57 million. We also expect our sales reserve to be 11 to 12 percent of contract sales for the balance of the year, several hundred basis points above our historical norms, where I expect we will remain until we see loan performance improve. As John mentioned, we believe lower inflation and a more normalized maintenance fee increase for 2025 will improve our portfolio performance in the future. Development margin declined year over year, excluding the increased reserve due primarily to lower VPGs and higher marketing and sales costs, partially offset by lower product cost. Excluding the increase in our sales reserve, our development margin would have been 27% in the quarter. Rental profit in our vacation ownership segment increased $11 million year over year, driven by higher rental revenue and $8 million of incremental costs allocated to marketing and sales expense. Finally, as expected, financing profit declined 10% year over year, driven by higher interest expense, partially offset by increased financing revenue, while resort management profit increased 9%. As a result, adjusted EBITDA in our vacation ownership segment declined 26% year over year. Moving to our exchange and third-party management segment, adjusted EBITDA declined $7 million compared to the prior year driven by lower exchanges and getaways at interval and decreased profit at Aqua Aston due to softness in Maui. As a result, total company adjusted EBITDA declined 29% year over year and would have been roughly in line with our expectations and consensus EBITDA for the quarter, excluding the increase in our sales reserve. Moving to the balance sheet. We ended the quarter with net debt to adjusted EBITDA 4.4 times and $820 million in liquidity. We also have nearly $1 billion of inventory on our balance sheet, including inventory reported in property and equipment, enough to support more than two years of future sales. Moving to guidance. With the first half behind us, we are lowering our full year adjusted EBITDA guidance range to between $685 million and $715 million. We now expect contract sales to grow 1 to 3% for the year, reflecting second quarter results and our updated second half forecast of 3 to 7% growth. We expect second half tours to grow 12% year over year at the midpoint, with VPG declining 7%. Three points of the tour growth is expected to come from Lapping Maui this month. Asia Pacific, which will benefit from the reopening of our second Bali sales center, is expected to drive another four points of the growth. 
package pipeline is expected to drive another two to three points of tour growth the second half of the year, while the opening of Waikiki will drive another point. Excluding Maui, we expect year-over-year -year contract sales growth in the second half of the year to be approximately 3% at the midpoint of our revised guidance range, consistent with our first half performance. We now expect development margin to be around 22% for the year, including a three-point impact from the additional reserve. Our VO rental business had a very strong first half, and transient keys on the books for the second half are up 4% compared to last year. As a result, we now think rental profit could increase by more than $30 million for the year. We also think resort management profit growth in the second half of the year will be consistent with the first half. In our exchange and third-party management business, we expect interval members to be down a few points for the year and average revenue per member to be largely unchanged. As a result, we expect adjusted EBITDA to decline in the $11 to $13 million range in the second half of the year, with roughly half of that coming from Aqua Aston due to Maui. Finally, G&A is expected to be down $8 to $10 million year over year in the second half driven by our cost savings initiatives. Moving to cash flow. We now estimate that our adjusted free cash flow will be in the $300 to $340 million range this year, reflecting our updated adjusted EBITDA guidance. Included in this guidance is $10 million of lower inventory spending. Our plan is to deploy our free cash to repay some of our corporate debt, as well as return cash to shareholders through dividends and buybacks, while our goal remains to get our leverage back to three times by the end of 2025. With that, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Paul? Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, press star one on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star two if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. Our first question is from Ben Scheiken with Mizuho. Please proceed with your question. Hey, how's it going? Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Morning, um, you gave us a lot of information on the call, which is super helpful, but maybe stepping back and just simplifying. When you updated the guide in June, it implied plus 7% growth X Maui in 2Q, and then X Maui accelerate to plus 10% in the back half of the year. I think from the guide today, based on our map, and I think you've confirmed it, Jason, it implies in the back half plus three X Maui. So can we just like simply just walk through a few of the buckets? What are the biggest factors that, ha that help you bridge from the plus 10 that was previously implied in the back half, again, X Maui, to the plus three, which I think is correct? Um, thanks. Yeah, Ben. Uh most of it's just going to be our assumptions around VPG. Um, you know, we, uh, as we talked about on the call, we did see some softening in VPG on first-time buyers. Um, I also mentioned we are adjusting promotions and, and, you know, both for owners, but also, um, more importantly, for some of the first-time buyers to try and drive that VPG up in the second half of the year. But... Till we see the, you know, the improvement, you know, we guided it a little bit more conservatively, I'd say, on what we think VPGs are going to do versus our original expectations. So a lot of work getting done. The team's focused on it. Um, but, you know, no different than a lot of consumer businesses that, that you're hearing. There's, there's some, uh, you know, cautious uh, folks out there on the spend side. The good news for us is people are prioritizing getting on vacation. We're seeing that in our resort occupancies at 90 plus percent. Uh, people are renting. You know, we're seeing that in our rental business and, and getting on vacation. Um, so um, that bodes well to maybe offset some of that uncertainty. But uh, uh, we need to get our VPGs uh, going back the right way. Gotcha. And I guess that inflection you saw was just in the last couple of weeks of June. And then has it, I guess, has it gotten, continued to get worse? Like, ooh, what is yeah, the case? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, were, we, we had a great May. Uh, VPGs were, you know, in line with last year uh, on a total basis. And, you know, as we talked about, VPG for owners were flat year over year, uh, which was great. Um, owners loved the product, you know, 
prioritize that spend in terms of getting on vacation. Where we, where we saw the softness from May to June was more in that first time buyer. And at the same time, our strategy is we it was we talked about is to grow first time buyers, right? So tours are up nine uh, percent to first time buyers, but you saw that softening uh, in VPG, which you know once again, given the broader macro, I'm not sure is a, a big surprise. The good news, right? You know, and we just obviously closed July yesterday. We don't have all the details, but at a high level, um, we saw those VPGs improve uh, sequentially. Uh, still down a bit year over year, but not what we saw in June. So we already made uh, a few adjustments uh, in the middle of July on some of our owner programs and, and upgrades, sales, and things like that. So that helped uh, in July. And as I mentioned, uh, we're rolling out other promotions here um, you know, more broadly for both owners and first-time buyers. Uh, so uh, we expect to, to get some traction with that here going forward as well. Got it. I appreciate it. That's all for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Our next question is from David Katz with Jeffries. Please proceed with your question. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for all the information. Um, if, if we could maybe go one more layer, um, it is, it, you know, if we broke down the inbound, you know, new buyer um, target customers, uh, is there any segmenting we could do where we could point to specific categories or groups or geographies or, you know, any further insight on sort of where there's more weakness rather than less? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at a, at a high level, David, to your, your question, um, you know, locations like Orlando, right, um, Myrtle Beach, where, you know, probably a little different customer than, say, is going to Hawaii, uh, for example, or, um, you know, some of our California locations. Um, you're probably seeing a, a disproportionate impact on, you know, from first-time buyers coming from consumers at that location uh, more broadly from last year. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it is a little bit the consumer, right, in the mix of the consumer who's showing up. We talked about Maui um, being softer and recovering slower. You are seeing that uh, in terms of the visitors, you know, occupancies for us are back, uh, still softer than where they were pre-wildfires. Uh, but the, the visitors, because of the discounting, and it's a little bit different, right? And that's a little bit different customer uh, in terms of, of buying vacation ownership. So we've seen that a little bit uh, in terms of that recovery there in Maui. But, um, yeah, I, I think a little bit is just the, the location at times and the consumers that are going to those locations. Perfect. Um, very helpful. And if I could just follow up and, and, and ask about, Sort of the trajectory through the quarter, and you know whether and you, you may have touched on this, but you know whether June was worse than May and May was worse than April, et cetera. Whether there's some acceleration sure. going on. Yeah, it, April started out, it, it, you know, a little bit softer than our expectations, and then we saw, you know, May doing very well, kind of flat VPGs as we talked about, and you know, we drove owner uh, and, and uh, first time buyer tours. Uh, and so when we put that you know, outlook for the second quarter uh, in the beginning of June, the trajectory looked good. Uh, and then all of a sudden we saw uh, you know, some of that softness, uh, you know, more on the first time buyer side, but a little bit uh, even on the owner side in June uh, with VPGs being down a little bit. Um, like I said, uh, now moving into July, we've seen those VPGs uh, recover, right, from where we were uh, in, in June, still down year over year, so we've, we've got some opportunity there, but that, that's what we're building into the forecast that they are going to be a little bit softer than the first half. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we're rolling out some programs and, and things to really try and drive that VPG uh, higher here as we go through the second half of the year. And so July is slightly better, right? 
Yeah, July was, you know, on an absolute basis, you know, VPGs in July were kind of what we saw overall for the second quarter, maybe a little bit better. Now, from a, there's always some seasonality and things, so you would expect a little bit of an increase, but uh, directionally, it was, um, you know, overall good to see some of the programs that we did roll out in, in you know, mid-July, uh, but like I said, some of these programs uh, were just getting rolled out here now, so not necessarily reflected in what we're seeing in July. Okay. Sorry for the third question. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Scholes with Truist Securities. Please proceed with your question. All right. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, really want to talk about the uh, the charge that you took. Um, really getting to the bottom line here is, you know, how can your financial control process rationalize two huge loan loss reserve charges in really um, just a few uh, short months here, and really in relation to the, you know, uh, COVID, it was only only a forty two million dollar charge, but much uh, much higher now. Uh, how, how do you how do you rationalize that? Thank you. Yeah, when, when we uh, took the charge last year, as we talked about, you know, we were, we were seeing higher delinquencies, which obviously leads to higher defaults, but we didn't have as much visibility, so we had to make assumptions, uh, and, you know, some of the, the thought around it was those higher delinquencies were coming from, you know, sales to people in, in 22, and even 23 that bought when, um, you know, costs were lower uh, for their own pocketbook, right, in terms of higher inflation. Um, you did see, you know, over those couple years, interest rates going up if, if you had credit card debt, things like that. So that stress on the consumer. And the expectation was that given historically how our notes perform, that those delinquencies would trend down. And, and we did start to see that, like we saw in the first quarter, those delinquencies uh, came down, you know, were trending down in April, but as Jason mentioned in his comments, then they kind of flattened out. You know, we were, you know, that, those delinquencies from April and May and June, they didn't go up, but as we talked about on the call, we needed to continue to see that improvement. So, um, you know, based on the, the higher delinquencies and not seeing the improvement that, um, we expected when we took the original charge, uh, we re-looked at it, uh, and so going forward, you know, we, we've kind of taken out the, a little bit of the risk of those delinquencies having to continue to come down significantly, right? Um, you know, we do expect uh, that hopefully they will get a little bit better here. Part of that is now, you know, inflation's stabilized on a, on a higher level. Uh, you know, we'll see with interest rate cuts and how that impacts consumer debt when the, when those start. Um, but also more importantly, uh, as I mentioned, our maintenance fees, uh, you know, at this point will, will only, you know, go up more inflate, you know, historical amounts, lower inflationary, less than 5% on our product, which also helps, uh, for, for owners and the cost of their vacations going forward. So, um, that gives us some confidence here that, this is enough to really cover what we're seeing, um, and we're, we're going to continue to work like we have been on, on getting those delinquencies down in collections and uh, hopefully do better than we're expecting. Okay. Um, give a little more color on what aspects of the loan loss is really uh, driving the charge, you know, specifically what vintage and even more so, whose vintages are we talking about? Um, you know, is it Astana? Is it Wealth? Is it Legacy? Mary Vacations? Thank you. Yeah, Patrick, this is, this is Jason. So um, as we've talked about, I, you know, in, over the last couple quarters, it's, it's really a little bit across the board in terms of brands as well as, as FICO. So it does depend, the materiality and, and the amount does depend on on which brand, to your, to your point, um, as well as the different FICO bands. So our, you know, above 700s are, are continuing to perform the best, but they have a little degradation. And then as you go down the FICO bands, you definitely see more stress 
um, and this in the below 700s and, and you know even a little bit in the below 600 you're starting to see even more stress so as you think about how that looks that's you know that's what we're focused on um, and that's really you know that's really kind of how it segregates I don't think what you're seeing in our portfolio is frankly different than what you're seeing in the broader you know finance sector uh, the lower the FICO scores the worse they perform um, and that's why you are you know a lot of commentary revolves around whether it's a, the lower end consumers or not so I think our performance uh, is relatively consistent on a relative basis with with what you're seeing more broadly out in, in the economy okay th uh, thank you I'll, I'll hop back in the queue thanks thank you our next question is from Brent Montour with Barclays please proceed with your question um, good morning. morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so, uh, question on um, first on the demand side. Um, I'm just trying to square the the comments, John, of, of demand for travel being strong, but but BPGs for new buyers and close rates being soft. I mean, the obvious reason, I guess, which I guess we haven't said it, but it's just it's just sort of the um, rejection or, or or shifting away from large ticket purchases. Um, on the consumer, can can you just maybe let's level set a little bit and and, and try and figure? I just want to figure out if this is more cyclical or, or post COVID normalization. You know, where are new buyer close? I know you can't tell me the exact number, but new buyer close rates now versus where the average is throughout the cycle versus where it is generally when it troughs in the cycle. Um, it, that would probably be helpful, just roughly directionally. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have, you know, the kind of historical close rates uh, to kind of walk you through. We can clearly uh, pull some of that analysis, but um, they're clearly lower than what we saw coming out of COVID, obviously, in, in 22. Um, you know, high level, I'd, I'd expect that, you know, they're, they're probably more in line with what we've seen historically on, on close rates. They could be a little bit lower, but yeah, what, what you're seeing is the, you know, a little bit of the, the softness with the first time buyer is that, that broader macro. People are traveling, but timeshare is a bigger commitment, right, if, if you're going to buy into it. Um, and they, they haven't had the benefit of owning the product. That's where the, the good news is you are seeing, notwithstanding a bit of the, the pressure on the consumer owners, continuing to buy and, and those uh, uh, closing rates are, you know, while lower than 22, uh, as we've seen some of that normalization have, have been pretty steady here. Uh, so, um, you know, We'll, we'll continue to work through it. That's where some of the incentives and, you know, trying to, to help with that first-time buyer close and, and things like that from a value proposition, um, those are all the things that, that we continue to work on. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. And, and then on the consumer loan piece, um, you know, the, I, I guess we're a little bit um, confused because of, Second charge in three, you know, in three quarters, uh, and it, you know, one of your we see one of your peers who's thought to have a slightly worse consumer hasn't had any charges yet. And I know that they reserve a lot higher than you guys do on a run rate basis, um, but I guess yours is getting sequentially worse uh, relative to them. And, and so, so I, I want to make sure that I understand: it, has there been a shift in your? lending strategy that has changed the quality of your consumer over time versus your prior um, sort of run rate? And then a specific stat, if we could just, uh, Jason, give us the, the percentage of the book that's below 700. Sure. Now, in terms of targeting our consumer, uh, you know, our FICO scores, how we target, nothing, you know, has, has changed. Um, I mean, if you look at it more historically, obviously with the acquisitions uh, that we did, first with uh, ILG and Vistana, um, you know, with, with the Sheraton uh, customer, 
probably on average lower uh, you know, quality from a credit uh, than, than we have seen historically on the legacy Marriott side. And then the same thing with the Welk acquisition, uh, the, the legacy Welk customer uh, below, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the credit quality that, so that mix uh, has changed with some of the acquisitions, but as, as you talk about, you know, the last couple years, uh, and, and specifically how we target, how we underwrite, um, really no shift in, in anything there. Uh, it is more, uh, I, like I said, some of the macro, uh, I think, on the consumer, as Jason mentioned, you know, whether it's, you know, credit card delinquencies, I think, are, you know, the highest they've been in, in 12, 13 years, I think I saw on something. So, you know, depending on the consumer, I, I think there's more stress on, on some consumers versus others. Yeah, and I think it's also important to remember this is relative to our expectations. So, to your point, our reserves have historically been lower and still remain uh, among the lowest in the industry. Um, and then to your last question, 28% uh, of our loan book is, is below 700 right now, and that's been pretty consistent over the last couple of years, so no real changes um, in that, uh, that stratification. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question is from Chris Boronka with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Hey, Chris. Thanks for taking the question. Hey, John. Um, so I, I did have one, one follow-up question on the loan loss, but, but we can take a break from that for a minute. And the, the first question, um, if we look at Maui, and, and, you know, you guys are not alone in citing that as, you know, being slower to recover, um, I think, you know, some of your peers in the hospitality industry have, you know, kind of suggested that the, you know, the, 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 the marketing efforts by the government maybe, you know, could, could use a little bit of a boost. Is that, you know, a fair assessment? Are you guys working with them to, to try to – it's not a position they've historically had to be in. I get it. Um, but, but is there anything that, you know, would encourage you that they're, um, you know, they're, they're getting more – ramping up their, their efforts to get folks back? Yeah, no, that, that, that I would say is a, a kind of a true observation. Uh, we, yeah, we continue to, to work uh, with the, the local governments. We'd love to see that, but it's, it's a bit of a, a balance, right, with the Maui residents and, and people returning to the island. Um, so we're, we're going to continue to work that. We're going to be there a long time. We know that's going to be a great destination uh, like it was uh, over time so uh, we'll, we'll continue to work with with the you know local island governments and and do and, and work with them in the right way okay uh, fair enough thanks thanks John and then the, the follow-up on the back to the loan loss is just you know how much um, I guess how much what, what are you how much data are you collecting from from folks? And, 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 yeah, yeah, I know you get FICO and you get you know all the things on the application, but are you getting any feedback from folks about why they're walking away? Is it, is it purely financial? Is it maintenance fees? Is it something else? And is, is there anything that makes you want to you know change the application process a little bit to collect a little more information on these folks? And maybe also are these folks just walking away? Are they totally defaulting? Or are they going through a a third party or any color on that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, so first, um, we have not seen really any evidence that, that any of the defaults are being caused by the third party. We haven't had that really in our entire history, and, and we don't have it today. So um, I think that's, you know, on the positive side, that that activity hasn't picked up for us like it has maybe for some others. Um, in terms of, you know, why folks default, most people don't really tell you uh, at the end of the day. Uh, we do ask. We do solicit feedback. Uh, we capture that feedback. But, but generally, the number one answer is it's expensive, right? And, and with given inflation and everything else, this is my words, not necessarily a customer's words. It, it makes sense. The overall cost of living out there has increased pretty significantly over the last two years, not just the cost of the, the, the timeshare product, but also just everyone's daily living cost. And, and that seems to be putting more pressure. But um, most don't really give you a reason, and then that would be the number one reason that people do give you if they do give you a reason at all. 
Okay. Um, fair enough. Thanks, guys, and, and best of luck in the, in the second half. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Sean Kelly with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just wanted to hit on uh, the subject of margins a little bit. You know, I, I think we rewind. I heard a, a bit about mix shift as it relates to, you know, a, a bigger focus on, you know, first time and new owners. Obviously, that's what's partially dragging down the VPGs. And then secondarily, um, you know, John, I think a number of times you mentioned um, incentives as sort of a way to, you know, I guess, you know, drive tour flow and probably, you know, uh, push uh, – the contract sales piece a bit. So uh, I'm wondering about the implications of that a little bit as it relates to margins. Um, could you just walk us through sort of, you know, the impact of that mix and, and how you factor that in, be it to your outlook for development margin or your outlook for just bro broader VOI margin? And am I right in thinking that, you know, those should have some negative impact there? Thanks. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right on the first time buyer mix, as we talked about in the second quarter. Um, our strategy to grow first-time buyers, package tours, which are, are focused, uh, you know, primarily on first-time buyers. So, as that mix or, or mix of tours goes up, yeah, the, the math would be, you know, you get slower VP or lower VPGs uh, on an overall basis. And yes, we factored that into how we thought about our guidance uh, for the second half of the year. So um, that's in there, and then. The other piece, right, if, if the incentives work, right, yeah, there could be uh, a little bit more cost, right, uh, related to that that would negatively impact. But you get the VPG's up, you get the flow through, um, you can offset that or maybe do a little bit better depending on how the VPG's, uh, you know, improve. So that, that's where, we're, you know, and, and we've talked about this, we're always, you know, making tweaks to um, the promotions and things based on what we're seeing. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's based on, you know, particular things that we see and what's going on, like we're seeing now with first-time buyers. So we'll adjust those accordingly. Uh, and if we can execute on the VPG side, that, you know, hopefully offsets the margin impact of, of the cost of those higher incentives. And, and did I catch it correctly that you said 26% um, development margin in the quarter if you adjusted for the sales reserve? Was that, was that the right number? And is that are we looking at a similar magnitude for the back half, just sort of putting in putting all the X's nose together? Is it better than that or worse than that? We're, we're just kind of trying to understand the the underlying assumption and the guidance. Thanks. Yeah, it was 27% uh, for for the second. In quarter, if you add back that charge, we did in our prepared remarks say 22% for the year, including three points from the charge. So that would be called 25 uh, for the for the kind of the full year. Okay, tw 25 for the full year. Um, and and j just last one for me would be I, wait, Jason. Can you compare that to, wor to where we were? Uh, sorry. Percent on that as a percentage of contract sales going forward, uh, which is a little bit higher. And then, uh, you know, we should see some benefit in product cost. Our product cost is coming in lower this year than we had originally expected, so we do have a pickup on that side in the guidance as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Schultz with True Securities. Please proceed with your question. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, I have a number of follow-up questions here. Um, have you changed anything in your uh, in the last uh, couple of years as far as your new sales writing uh, excuse me new sales underwriting criteria and uh, if so you know what specifically did you change and related to that um, you know how how is your sales underwriting criteria in your legacy Marriott vacations product different from um, you know, that, that of Welk, and, I, and I'm trying to really, you'll see in my further questions, trying to sort of drill down more on, on Welk here. Um, thank you. So I, just so I'm clear, when you say sales, are you talking uh, credit underwriting, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, get credit underwriting at, for the sales, yes. 
Yeah, um, nothing significant uh, in in terms of uh, you know holistic changes. We're always looking at you know down payment requirements and and things like that. Um, you know, we could have you know had some tweaks to to bring those up in certain locations, but nothing whole. Holistically, I don't want to say nothing's changed, but uh, I wouldn't say there there were any pervasive changes in in terms of how we look at our underwriting and and the requirements to to get the financing. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about Welk. Um, you know, how is that deal performing versus uh, your expectations at the time of acquisition? Um, and, you know, what trends are you seeing um, within specifically the wealth customer as far as uh, default rates versus uh, your legacy uh, customers? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the from a default rate, uh, we knew this coming in, wealth uh, customers had a, had a higher default rate. So that's kind of in our mix if you will, of uh, the overall higher defaults of, uh, on the portfolio. I'd say from an overall transaction, you know, we still see the long-term value. I think some of the transition, um, you know, it's probably taken a little bit longer. We're seeing a lot of good traction um, this year on, on our sales performance there, but still a lot of opportunity. We're not, we're not where we want to be yet in, in terms of overall VPGs and, and things that we're seeing at, at our high um uh, portfolio uh, products, so a um, lot of good work there uh, by the team and a lot of good improvement, uh, and we're on a good trajectory there. Uh, but like I said, we're overall, we're probably not where we wanted to be when we first underwrote it, underwrote it but um, that means there's also good opportunity going forward. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I'd like to hand the floor back over to management for any closing comments. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining our call today. As you heard on our call, second quarter results were mixed with double-digit rental profit growth being offset by lower contract sales. In addition, while Maui is recovering, it's not recovering at the pace we expected. Our new Waikiki Resort is slated to open in early October. This will be our first new U.S. resort opening since the pandemic, adding more exciting vacation destinations for our owners and other guests. We also have a number of new resorts planned to open over the next few years, including our new Western resorts in Savannah and Charleston, as well as a new Marriott Resort in Thailand and additional units in Bali. And while we're not satisfied with our results, we have, fundamentally, we have a fundamentally strong business that generates free cash flow, a high percentage of owner sales which reflect the quality of our product offering, and a team of dedicated associates who go to work every day to provide memorable experiences for our owners and guests. On behalf of all of our associates, owners, members, and customers around the world, I want to thank you for your continued interest in our company, and I hope to see you on vacation soon. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.